Today we're going to talk about atomic structure and specifically atomic history. We're going to start early. We're going to start with Democritus. He was a Greek professor, which was around 400 BC. And he was the first one to suggest the existence of tiny fundamental particles that make up matter. Basically, what he said was, if I keep breaking an object smaller and smaller and smaller, I'm going to break it until we get to some fundamental particle that's the same for everything. He didn't know what it was. He didn't know anything about it. But he knew you would break down into something something substantial, something that was fundamental. He coined the term atomos, which is what we call atoms. Much, much later, a scientist named John Dalton came along and he did experiments and he studied the ratios in which elements combine in chemical reactions. He looked to see how much hydrogen combined with how much oxygen to make water. He based his ideas of his atomic theory on the results of his experiments. His atomic theory is broken into five major steps. And his ideas, although simple, are rather significant. His first um, contribution was that all elements are composed of tiny particles called atoms. So he made that statement. He reaffirmed what Democritus had said. His second part was that atoms of the same element are identical. He didn't really know how at this point, but he knew that if we were looking at certain elements, that their atoms must be the same. And then he said the atoms of any given element are different from those of another element. So he didn't know how they were different, but he knew that atoms that made up gold were different from atoms that made up lithium and were different from atoms that made up potassium. That these atoms are different, but he didn't know specifically how. And then he said atoms of one element can combine with atoms of another element to form compounds. And a given compound always has the same relative number and type of atoms. So what he was saying is that atoms of one element, such as hydrogen, can combine with atoms of another element, such as oxygen, to form water. And the formula for water will always be H2O. It will never be some other combination. You can also say carbon can combine with oxygen to make carbon dioxide and the formula for carbon dioxide will always be CO2. If it's carbon and one oxygen, which can happen, you would have carbon monoxide, which is a different compound. And then five, atoms are indivisible in chemical processes. A chemical reaction simply changes the way the atoms are grouped together. So we learned this in our first experiment, the evidence of interaction, that, that we can't create new elements and that we can't lose elements. So the elements in our reactions must stay the same and they just get recombined. Looking at the structure of the atom, the next thing that was discovered was electrons. They're negatively charged subatomic particles. They were discovered by J.J. Thompson, and he used this device called a cathode ray tube. What he did was he took electrons and he aimed them through here in this tube, which is um, connected to a vacuum pump. The electrons he shot out here, and they should have gone straight to the other plate. But if you notice, he has a negative plate here and a positive plate here. And the electrons, instead of going straight, were attracted towards the positive side and repelled from the negative side. And therefore, we concluded that electrons were negatively charged. This was in the late 1890s. So we've come a long way since Democritus. How are atoms arranged? J.J. Thompson came up with his model that he called the plum pudding model. He knew that atoms were electrically neutral. So therefore, if we have negative um, pieces, we must have positive pieces. And so if you count it, if we have our electrons that we count up, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, that there must then be nine, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. I have to mark that one. 
there must be nine positive particles. And so he looked at these and called it plum pudding. He called it that because there was a popular pudding at his time um, that had raisins in it. And so his thing was like the atom was like the pudding and the electrons were like raisins stuck in the pudding. Rutherford in 1911 did an experiment with gold foil. He shot positive alpha particles at gold foil. And on the next slide, I'll show you a diagram of what um, his experiment looked like. If Thompson's model, his plum pudding model, was correct, the large alpha particles should, should crash through the gold foil. So if we're looking at this one here, which is J.J. Thompson's model, these alpha particles are considered to be so big, they're a helium nucleus, that they should just blast on through this plum pudding model. What he found was that, in fact, some of the particles came in and were deflected which meant that there must be something more substantial in parts of an atom. And if we look at his experiment, some of the particles bounce back. If we look at his experiment on this slide, this was a radioactive source. This is where our alpha particles were, and they were shot here to this gold piece of gold foil. Around here is this fluorescent screen. So this screen is what recorded the alpha particles. So most of the particles did bounce, come straight through, and were marked here, but several were deflected. Now the analogy of this is like this gold foil, if this was tissue paper, this idea was so astounding that it was sort of the equivalent of shooting a gun, shooting a bullet at a piece of tissue paper and having the bullet bounce back. It just didn't make sense using J.J. Thompson's plum pudding model. So that developed this idea of the nuclear atom. An atom with a dense center of positive charge, which is the nucleus, in which tiny electrons moved in a space that was otherwise empty. So the particles could pass through, the alpha particles, as long as they passed through around here, but any time an alpha particle would hit a nucleus, because it's dense and it's positive, it would cause it to bounce off. And the nucleus contained the positively charged protons. The neutron was discovered by scientist Rutherford and then also a scientist named Chadwick. They are subatomic particles with slightly more mass than a proton, but they have no charge. And then if we look at protons, neutrons, and electrons in summary, protons are positively charged and they're found in the nucleus. Neutrons are neutral subatomic particles and they're also found in the nucleus. Electrons are negatively charged and they're found outside the nucleus. Protons and neutrons additionally are also um, considered to be much more heavy. They are, they are contribute to the mass of the atom, and electrons' um, mass is considered to be negligible in terms of the atom. Um, thank you very much, and I hope you have a good day.